friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. I'm Shankar Hemadi, founder and CEO of Blue Horizons, where new technologies meet vertical markets. And with me is Pete Rodriguez, CEO of Silicon Catalyst. He's been a pioneer and the whole Silicon Catalyst movement has pioneered the idea of incubators in semiconductors. And without semiconductors, there would be no artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all the things that we are experiencing, the way the world is changing. Uh, Pete, tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up at Silicon Catalyst and where we are going. Okay, thank you, Shankar. Thanks for having us, and thank you for being an advisor uh, in the Silicon Catalyst ecosystem. It's, uh, my, it's my honor to be a part of the Silicon Catalyst family. Okay, I'll go very quickly, but uh, I came to the U.S. from Cuba when I was nine as a refugee. Nine years later, ended up at Caltech. Uh, a few years later, ended up in Silicon Valley. So now we move forward to the early 80s. I did about 10 years of heavy lifting in R&D, um, and uh, some of the projects included, uh, we were the first team to take a microprocessor, which at the time was a MIPS core, and put it in a standard cell ASIC. So we did that. And there's some interesting folks. The gentleman at, at SGI who was managing this was Rick Barr, who's one of our advisors. Um, the applications engineer that helped us put the core in place worked for Jensen Wang at LSI, who went off to do NVIDIA. Um, the product uh, director was Moshe Gabriela, who, who's a supporter of Silicon Catalyst, but went off to have a, an amazing career on the board of TSMC. So it's amazing. You go back to 1992 and what all the different connection points were. Anyway, after that, I did a startup that we built a great product. Right at the, everything was correct, but it failed because it go to market. So I like to joke that I had a lobotomy and I went into sales and I joined LSI Logic um, and had a, a, a wonderful time there. I ran one of the largest businesses uh, before I left. I did 10 years of startups, uh, including an RF solutions company uh, that we sold to Agilent in 2006. And then went off back to the to the the big corporate world. Um, was CMO at Virage for a little bit of time. Learned more about IP and, and how to sell a semiconductor IP. Ran XR, a public company, for a few years, and then joined NXP, um, where I ran Interface and Power. Grew that to about a billion dollar business, very profitable. And then I retired, and I had a good retirement. I was having fun. I was skiing, you know, forty days traveling. And then Rick Lesansky, our chairman, ruined my life. You know, he kept uh, stringing me in. Hey, invest in this company. Hey, advise this company. And so after about almost two years of that, I joined Silicon Catalyst in late 2017. And I'm very happy to report that, you know, we have exploded and we're helping entrepreneurs around the world. We accelerate them. We help them keep a larger chunk of the company. Um, and as you, as you know, we've grown in every way, you know, from number of advisors to investors to corporate. Uh, we've accepted um, over 90 companies out of about 900 that we've looked at. And uh, again, we're doing God's work in the semiconductors. Well, I'm wondering, uh, Silicon Catalyst has played a very pivotal role in um, much of the hardware and many of the essential technologies I, I see battery companies, I see companies that are involved in RISC-V and in many other areas. How did you manage to become this large this quickly with very little financial support from others and literally a ground up startup, if you will, and bring in some of the most luminary advisors and investors and tell, tell us a little bit about the whole history sure, of Silicon sure. Catalyst. It's definitely been a journey, but it's also been where it got to the point where it was self-feeding, right? One advisor would invite another and so forth. And we probably have over 20 former public company CEOs and, and former public, public company CTOs as part of the 250 advisors. And uh, and uh, obviously the top 40 or 50 are industry luminaries. Um, but Silicon Catalyst started with a CMOS focused which expanded to SOI, expanded to compound. Later, we expanded to MEMS and sensors, photonics. And then most recently, we expanded to the intersection of life science and semiconductors, which is really world-changing, right? When uh, you, you help people uh, in their health and we've expanded into materials. So each expansion has taken uh, hiring a partner that is an expert in that area, bringing on advisors that are experts in that area, bringing on in-kind partners and strategic partners that are, so for example, if you look at MEMS, 
you know, we we uh, it was cornered around, you know, ST Micro and Bosch and TI. If you look at materials, we now have EMD, you know, Mark and and Sony and others. And there's there's many companies that play in our network and aren't necessarily officially partners. You know, Intel, Samsung, etc. Um, so um, that's how we have expanded, and we look. For, we don't look for any one area. We're not focused in only AI at the edge or life science. We look for everything that a tier one VC looks for, you know, a value proposition, a product market fit, a good team. Can you deliver? And if you can deliver, is there an ROI here? And then we go further in two uh, steps. One, the diligence we do is like no other. You know, we bring in our 11, the, the chief scientists and so forth that are 11 strategic partners. We bring in the best advisors in the world in that area whether it's, you know, Dr. Kurt Peterson for MEMS, you know, or, or, or other, other folks, you know, uh, that we've mentioned. Um, and then we also look at how much can we help. If we can't help that startup that much, then we want to save that slot for another startup that we can actually help. And what we provide is around $3 million of uh, free goods and services that they can save, okay, um, during the seed phase uh, and probably a year of acceleration. Uh, and we have a custom incubation that's two years long minimum. We assign one of our senior partners uh, to that company for the entire duration. So this is very different from any incubator or accelerator in the world. Okay. And uh, I mean, it's a joy to see that you have gone through at least two or three generations of hardware. I mean, we're talking about quantum leaps at each step. There's a lot of concern lately that with AI ML coming in, generative AI, that a lot of jobs will be lost. Having seen these generations of hardware and software and systems, what's your prediction for the future? Will there be like 80% unemployment or what will happen? You've seen it happen before. Right, so right. I mean, if we go back to even the Apollo program, right? Uh, look at the number of jobs, the materials, the industries that it created. Right. So every time there's a, a jump forward in technology, there's tremendous opportunity that is created. Now, having said that, uh, the U.S. needs to get more serious about teaching STEM. Right. And um, and, and really teaching it and having get, kids get excited about it. And so I think, you know, a good chunk of the CHIPS Act is going to be focused on workforce development now, you know, across the board, um, you know, even the, the minority colleges, but also, you um, you know, more STEM teaching across the board and more sponsoring of scholarships. I also think what we need to solve, you know, if someone comes to the U.S. and gets a master's or PhD in electrical engineering, man, just stamp a, a green card to their certificate, you know, so they can stay and help us here because it's going to be a long time before we build that pipeline of workforce development. But there are much uh, brighter minds than mine, like Suche, the Dean of Engineering at Berkeley, that are working on these problems. Uh and, and they have better answers than I do in this area. But I do believe that, yes, some of the lower end jobs that require less education will be absorbed. And we see that already, right? Where you go and instead of talking to someone to order fast food, you push you know, a screen, but there'll be so many opportunities. Um, I was in Silicon Valley when we started the automation and the fab. And you know, for every eight operators, we, we didn't need any more. We needed two uh, mechanical engineers you know, two maintenance engineers. And those are much better jobs. They're much better paying jobs, right? So every time we do a leap forward in technology, there's an explosion of opportunities, but it does require a trained workforce. And you mentioned uh, the role that uh, Silicon Catalyst is already playing in the in the medical, um, uh, you know, med tech space. Can you elaborate on that? And how, where do you see medicine going with yeah, all this so technology? So clearly, you know, the sensors that are being created, uh, the analysis that AI and ML can bring combined with the sensors. So our medical startups, um, we have four that we have accepted out of about 20 that have applied. We're in the process of hopefully selecting one or two more. We definitely have a focus in that area. Uh, when we look for a company, whether in medical or anywhere else, we're looking for a solution. Okay. We're not looking to do something that's jelly bean. We look for a differentiated solution centered on semiconductor. Right. Um, for whether it's, you know, an RF or, or uh, you know, or sensing or, or AI. Uh, however, for the medical areas, what we're seeing is intersection with materials, intersection with MEMS analysis. You know, AI can definitely help with the analysis of the of the results. 
Um, but we can see technologies that I'll, I'll just describe a handful of our companies. One of our companies looks at circular DNA, it came out of Stanford, and um, it could predict stage one cancer two or three years before stage one cancer. I mean, that would be a huge benefit to, to the population. Another one is trying to do 3D printing of DNA to, to have solutions. Others look at other uh, different parts of the genome to, uh, to again, to predict cancer. We have some that actually cure cancer. We have one that does about 10% of what Theranos claimed to do, but it actually works. Also, this one also came out of Stanford. And uh, and they're starting to, to, to ship kits that you can do tests at home with one drop of blood, right? Um, for food safety, you know? Um, and so there's just, the sky's the limit, I think, of all the different uh, intersection of the technologies that are coming to play. And uh, I also remember uh, through some of our meetings that we have a lot of work going on in autonomous vehicles and in general in autonomous systems and the building blocks, the batteries and all that. How is that proceeding? And do you see things going beyond cars into new oh, it, modes of transportation? It, absolutely. Um, we have a handful of battery companies that are working on new technologies that are safer and, and have more uh, power uh, density. Uh, some of that are at the early stage, and, and it is complex. Uh, the materials, things are complex. We also have um, companies that are working on radars and, and, and different things like that that can be applied to, to the solutions. First with ADAS, you, you can't wait for autonomous vehicles. Some of my VC friends says, we're going to get to Mars before we have fully autonomous. Um, but in the process to move towards autonomy, you're going to have huge improvements in, in ADAS. Uh, one of our companies that's very close to my heart, uh, has a, um, a high density IR, non-illuminated IR sensor, okay? So they can basically, you can be driving down the road and it could tell you there's a deer at 50 feet that you can't see with the naked eye, right? So it also does ranging and does classification using AI. Uh, that can be way beyond cars. You could put that in uh, airports, you can put that on trains, right? Um, you, you can see, 400 people coming down the row of an of an airport aisle and say, hey, that individual over there has 103 temperature. Um, and, and you can meet some of the criteria that some of the governments like Europe are putting into place where you can determine the number of people in a car but without doing the identification, which there are laws that are going to prevent, you know, face recognition and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, there's so many of our companies that we're so excited about. You know, our first graduate was IR Labs. And their solution, I think they already have two of the top sockets in the world. Their solutions will speed up, you know, data centers by probably 10x. And um, so very excited about that, what, what that can mean. It, it, is, it is still the cloud, but it's, you know, it's accelerating the cloud. Uh, and then we have a handful of solutions of AI at the edge. Uh, and then a gazillion sensing solutions. It's literally a village to make new things possible today. Right. Uh, so the ecosystem is really critical. Um, Silicon Catalyst and you all have created an entire, um, you know, ecosystem. Tell us more about what constitutes the ecosystem and how it's accelerating things and how it's retaining a lot of the equity for the founding teams and the early employees. Yeah. So our ecosystem is composed of our strategic partners, which TI was the first, Bosch is the largest, NXP is the latest. Arm was the first to join us, both a strategic and in-kind, SD Micro followed. Um, these companies help us uh, do the diligence along with our advisors, help select who gets into the incubator, also provide funds for our operations. Um, and we run incredibly lean. Um, our advisors, which we've already talked about, are investors, over 300 investors. Um, but a key component is our in-kind partners. These are companies that provide us hundreds of millions of dollars equivalent in goods and services that we then give to our startups. And our top of our 80 plus partners, our top partner has been TSMC. They have just been beyond wonderful support all the way to the board. And, and, and even during these tough times when people couldn't get access, every one of our startups got scheduled for an MPW. So they provide free, uh, free shuttles at most process nodes within certain requirements, but they have been a tremendous partner. Very close behind TSMC has been Synopsys, providing you know, EDA tools to our startups and intellectual property in the last couple of years. EDA tools from day one, 
Um, so they have been really, really a strong supporter. And then ARM has come up behind that, you know, as a, as a great supporter. And then ST for their MEMS uh, foundry. Um, but it's over 60 companies today. So at a certain level, our designers can design the chip. You know, our entrepreneurs can design the chip for free, use an intellectual property during the prototype phase for free, go to and make it the, a production prototype you know, at the world's number one foundry, go to the world's number one test company and do a production test on it. Um, and so the entrepreneur is not only going to get hugely accelerated because all these relationships are already in place, um, but it's going to save a tremendous amount of money um, that they can then keep a larger percent of the equity of the company. And they can get through that seed phase. If you look at semiconductor companies, my biggest frustration is you have so many wonderful entrepreneurs with so many great ideas and they can't get off the ground. But if they come with us, there's many ways to get off the ground. They could do a friends and family round, some sweat equity, get some university help, get some government grants, you know, do some angel funding. And because we do everything else and we accelerate them, they can get to the next level. Now, when you go raise money with a production prototype in hand, it's a different game, right? It's, and you know this, right? It's a, it's a, it's a different game. You're in a much stronger position. And that's what we help too. In fact, I'm getting all excited. Um, I want to probably go not just to software, but bring in a hardware element so I can be a part of the Silicon Catalyst family. <laughs> so um, speaking of which, uh, the sub semiconductor supply chain has been an ongoing issue over the last few years. And we saw that acutely during the pandemic. And now even with the geopolitics, the way things are. Um, do you see a role that both Silicon Catalyst is playing and overall the ecosystems are playing to strengthen the supply chain? Yeah, so I think um, our startups did not suffer too much because the ones that were starting volume production were in older nodes and uh, technology nodes. And so there was availability. And then the ones that um, were in newer nodes or more advanced nodes um, only needed you know, evaluation kits for their customers. Right, and then and we were able, like I said, to get the shuttles uh, at TSMC, so that didn't slow us down. Uh, there were slowdowns in terms of getting packaging and other things that were needed, uh, even circuit boards. Um, but in terms of the future and supply chain, I think the the Department of Commerce that we worked with very closely with, uh, especially my my partner Dan Ambrus, uh, co-founder of Silicon Catalyst, um, understands. The supply chain much better today than they did a couple of years ago. Understand that it can not only be U.S. based, right? It has to be at, at, at a minimum friendly based Europe and Japan and so forth. Um, and that the key components like ASML and and, and you know uh, Tokyo Electron, besides the great companies that we have in the U.S. like AMAD and LAM and so forth, uh, um, it's a worldwide supply chain for equipment. It's a worldwide supply chain for foundry. I'm excited that we definitely need more manufacturing in the U.S., right? We we let it go away and we definitely need more. But, you know, we're at 12 percent. Can we get to 20 percent, you know, with the chip sack? That would be nice. Can we have more assembly and test and packaging? That would be nice. But I think innovation is really the differentiator for, for the U.S. and even, even more important than supply chain. We need to make sure that we encourage innovation. And we have been the Look at our companies, right? Qualcomm, NVIDIA, et cetera. We have been the, the innovative leads, so AMD. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and uh, what I really in, uh, like about uh, Silicon Catalyst is that it's gone way beyond just the United States into Europe and uh, probably expanding into Asia as well. Uh, please tell us a little bit about it and how it's really supporting this a global supply chain, both the localized as well as the global, how things are getting better and stronger. Yeah, so we, we've had applications. We, we've engaged, as I mentioned, with about 900 startups over eight years. Um, we've had applications probably on the order of 500 uh, from everywhere except Australia. Now, I have a meeting with an Australian startup tomorrow, so maybe we'll, we, I won't have to say that anymore. But we have, we've had startups in Argentina and South Africa, you know, in Korea. Um, you know, uh, around Asia, Singapore, um, all over Europe. Of course, Israel is, is a hotbed where we have an office. The UK is also very exciting where we have an office. And, um, but we, we like to help startups where they are, okay? 
Uh, however, sometimes in order to get funding, they need to incorporate somewhere like Israel or the UK or the US. Uh, obviously, US is probably number one, but um, depending on where they are in the world, it may not make sense. Uh, so we don't we don't necessarily want to move all the startups to Silicon Valley. That doesn't make sense, right? We want to help them where they are, but we do realize that sometimes there are constraints. It's very hard to get funding if you're like in Eastern Europe or you know in the Middle East, um, and you may have to reconsider and and, and you know where your uh, where your headquarters. But yeah, we help startups around the world again from pre seed to post A. And uh, do you have any advice for uh, startup founders? Because there are, there's a lot of innovation going on uh, and we need a lot more innovation for neural networks to work, for AI to work, to, for everything to work. What advice do you have for founders above and beyond the technology and innovativeness to make it successful? To make yeah, a company so or an organization this, successful. This could be an hour lecture, so I'll try to keep it short. But number one is market. Okay. If you look at, you know, the three rules of real estate are location. The five rules of, of VCs is, is there a market, right? And um, VCs are willing to take technology risk, but definitely not take market risk. And so number one, make sure that there's an ample market. And it's really your target market. I really hate presentations where somebody shows a trillion dollar market you know, when the, the truth is that they're going to attack, you know, 0.1% of that, right? Really have a focus of what you're going to attack. Uh, second, by the way, we spent tremendous, our team combined has raised a billion dollars of VC funds in our careers, right? Our, we're a very senior team across the world, right? Our management team. Our team combined has participated in over 65 billion worth of M&As, you know, as executives in the industry. Um, and so... Um, we spent a lot of cycles helping our entrepreneurs with their VC pitches. Okay. Having said all of that, you know, VCA will want slides one, two, three, and VCB will want slides four, five, six. So you're not going to get one presentation that makes everyone happy. But the second thing I ask for is a strong value proposition, right? How are we going to win? What is our secret sauce? How are we differentiated? Right. We get so many companies that say, okay, here's AI. And in this 10% of this AI, we're 20% better. It's like, that's not going to work. That's you're not going to make it. How do you compete in, with Nvidia with that? It's just not going to work, right? Uh, we need to show that over ninety percent of the product, you can have a ten x advance, you know, improvement, and then we're talking, right? Um, and can you really get there? And then you know, the team is important. Obviously, the market window is important. Can you make the market window? You know, I managed uh, a team at NXP where we did many many products for a very difficult customer that had no forgiveness. And we, you know, we would hit the ground running, the product would work, we ran to 100 million units. That uh, culture is not in most startups. There's a handful of startups where you see folks that, you know, delivered products at, you know, Broadcom and Qualcomm and other places uh, that have that culture, but most of them think, oh, we can take our time and you can't, you need to really fix that culture of first time right silicon. I've done a whole lecture on that, which is on our on our in our curriculum. We have a, a graduate level semiconductor focused curriculum for our CEOs, and then we do a couple of days a year of training. Now that uh, things have opened up post COVID, we're back to that. Um, the next thing is um, if you can really execute, is there a there there? Is there an ROI? And you have to talk to customers. And here's I think the most important part besides is there a market, which is is a customer willing to pay for it. Because a customer will meet with you and say, oh, I like it. That's good. Here's my wish list. And you really have to talk to multiple customers and say, what are they actually willing to pay for? Okay. And if you can get through all of that and have good confidence, then go build a company. Go take the time uh, to build a company and we can help you. We can even help you with the first part of the process. Um, well, thanks. And uh, a large number of people in our audience want to know how they can be, you know, using this, all this technology. There's machine learning coming up, there's generation coming up, there's high-speed connectivity, everything costs money and time. And the ROI is not always obvious. What advice do you have for the early customers in new technologies? And how should they approach it? Um, is it all about ROI? How long will it take to actually get the returns for their investment and some of it is speculative right 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 
So, I mean, I would encourage the systems companies in particular to take a look at, at what our companies are doing, right? We can provide that information. Uh, to take a look, can they help them with non-recurrent engineering that would focus, um, you know, what that solution is for a product that they could sell, right? For a system product that they can sell. Um, we have a handful of companies that have to build a system product, even though the core technology is the chip, right? Uh, so we look for chip plus software, chip plus sensor, chip plus system, uh, as part of a solution. Um, also invest in the companies, right? Take, you know, you can accelerate the companies by making a, a reasonable amount of investment. We have an angel group that we formed out of our ecosystem. It's now done 21 deals. It's um, syndicating with another seven or eight groups and writing fairly good. Mayfield is jumping in as a, a in, in our press release as a, a occasional co-investor. Um, and uh, you can really, with, with the right guidance, the right foundation, as we mentioned before, with our in-kind partners and a little bit of money, it's amazing to see some of our companies that have raised four or five million and look as good as companies in the past that raised 40 million. Okay. Also, um, we can focus on areas where a company can have a $40 million exit. We don't have to have billion dollar exits and they make an impact for the world and the entrepreneur makes money because they only took a few million to get to that point. Uh, so, you know, the companies that can raise 50 million, the folks that can raise 0.1%, maybe that can raise 50 million with PowerPoint, they probably don't need this, or we can help them, but not that much, but those folks are going to require billion dollar exits. And, and those are hard to do. Um, so anyway, encourage people to invest in semiconductors because again, it's the oxygen that makes, you know, hardware run, so, I mean, software run. So, uh, uh, it's the foundation for technology in the world. And contrary to popular belief, there seems to be an acu acute shortage of good hardware engineers today to make all this happen. And uh, to go into low code, no code, or fully automated systems, we need a lot more hardware uh, expertise. How are we going to solve this problem? And uh, what role has Silicon Catalyst or any of the partners played in uh, education, STEM education? Yeah, so so we, again, we work with uh, over 30 universities, but really more at the graduate level, right? Um, however, we we started a process working with um, with Cornell first and and Berkeley's uh, uh, Citrus, uh, where we take uh, students and not just uh, engineering students, we take in business students and put them in our startups or into Silicon Callus, and you know these paid internships. Uh, help them understand the semiconductor industry and how they can contribute. Uh, we talked about workforce development, and then there's a whole focus um, first within PCAS and then within the Department of Commerce on that. But I think what, my recommendation is you need to make it more exciting. I remember folks, I think it was Cal Poly that came to visit my high school, and they had a lot of crazy stuff, you know, uh, that was all uh, electronic engineering based. And that made an impact on me. I, I think we need to make it more exciting. Right now, the the kids feel that you know Google, Google and the software folks are uh, you know are wonderful and hardware is hard and I think we need to make hardware uh, more exciting uh, and more interesting um, you know uh, on average in in addition to all the things we've already discussed on workforce development. Well, I'm really excited about where where you have taken Silicon Catalyst so far and the possibilities in um, both strengthening the supply chain. Uh, creating a resilient pipeline of uh, hardware products along with IITs and all that. And good luck to every one of us because I'm also a part of the Silicon Catalyst movement. And uh, I think we are in for a whole new world. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, Pete. And I'm excited about all that's going on and how we can together make a better world. Thank you. Thank you for reaching out in the conversation.